there's only one guy here and he knows about it. Our fish, men's fish fry. Oh, really? On the 12th. <laughs> yep, he's, he's, he's catching them fish so we can eat them. Um, got another one. All right, there's another guy. Uh, our men's fish fry on the 12th. So uh, come, 11 o'clock. Uh, yes, our ladies are going to cook. As well, y'all you, are going to do most of the cooking as far as the fish uh, and I'll hush serve. puppies, but I serving. Don't, I don't do fish. Okay. But uh, yeah, and uh, so Sister Bonnie kind of line that up, whatever times or whatever they need to come. And uh, so that's going to be, we're doing something different than we normally do, just because I want to, I guess, is to try it out. Um, instead of doing our bre breakfast we normally do, I just thought we'd do something and, and have some fun, have some games in there. So we're going to do corno, possibly horseshoe. Uh, maybe we'll get some teams, have a tournament or something for corno, and just have a little bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to look bad now. Uh, but uh, that's on the twelfth. Um, also remember uh, the Adam Crab concert coming up in four weeks from Friday uh, on July second. So we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a great, great evening. Kick off our Fourth of July weekend. And uh, so, and that's no tickets. It's just a love offering. And uh, we'll have some reserve seating for our church right here. And then everybody else will fill in. So um, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll talk more about that, the plan, in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, I think that's it as far as announcements. Prayer requests, we want to pray for, uh, continue to pray for the requests that went out today for Chris. Several uh, people know him, bad bad accident today um, doesn't sound good but we know that the Lord's still in charge doesn't matter what the doctors say um, so let's pray for Chris and his family um, continue to pray for brother Theron Had a lot of trouble a lot of pain he's not going to be able to go to the doctor for a couple more weeks to get that checked out um, pray for Wendy she it's just kind of a freak thing um, we're uh, getting ready to leave my daughter's house yesterday and kind of gathering up everything and she went out the door my daughter has a pool and she went out the door and my daughter has a rottweiler puppy that's big uh, and as she went out the door he come out running out of the other room through the door behind her just kind of taking out her legs and she fell backwards on the patio and uh, so she's her whole backside's hurting her arm her back her backside her head um, thank God she didn't hit her head but uh, she's she's at home with a couple heat pads uh, and pillows surrounding her right now and uh, so pray for her she's um, got a bad headache with it too even though she didn't hit her head just uh, of course after we after she did that, we had to bump, bump around in the car for four hours coming home. So, um, so she, she's a very uncomfortable tonight. So let's pray for her. Um, that the Lord would just touch her and help her. Um, all the aches and pains. Um, anyone else? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's pray for Amanda. Oh. Got off um, no. Hello, Facebook friends. Somebody's watching. Don't know who. Um, any others? Terry's doing really well. Okay, great. Slowly getting stronger. Great. Pray the support there. You know, it's summertime, and let's pray for uh, traveling mercies for some folks, uh, Sherry and her family, her daughter, granddaughter, are leaving, I think, Friday to go out west to Oklahoma, what do you call it, Pioneer Woman, Pioneer Woman store or something or something. 
uh, just taking a road trip out there, uh, family vacay. Also, I just read that Pam and Audie Ash, who everybody knows, they're taking a like a 16-day road trip out west to Yellowstone and all that. So, um, you know, with not being able to travel last year with promise, um, they're taking a, a, a good vacation. Um, so let's pray for travel mercies for all those that may be traveling um, here in the, in the next little bit. So, yes. You said Bobby? Bobby? Okay. For colon cancer surgery. Okay. Okay. Still recovering. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Well, let's pray. Father, Lord, we just come to you tonight. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for just keeping your hand upon us, Lord, and, and blessing us and being with us, Lord, and just leading and guiding us, Lord, in, in all that we do. And Father, we pray, God, for uh, all that um, you are doing and all that you will be doing in our life. Lord, we pray for Sister Amy as she um, continues on um, with just walking through open doors that you have opened for her. And Lord, we just pray, God, for your blessing and Lord, for your touch, and Lord, we just pray, God, for uh, Amanda, that you would just touch her, whatever her need is, God, we know, Father, that you, Lord, are in control of all things, and Father, we pray, God, for um, Bobby getting ready to have colon cancer surgery, Father, we pray, God, that this surgery goes perfectly, Lord, that all of this cancer would be gone, that you would just completely heal her body, Father. We pray for Teresa and her family, Lord. We pray you continue to uh, help her to recover from her surgery. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in Terry's life and, Lord, what you're doing in his body, Father. We pray, Lord, you continue to touch him and strengthen him as he's recovering from his surgery, Father. And, Lord, we pray for Brother Theron. Lord, he, he's having a lot of trouble with pain and aches and Father, we just pray, God, that you just touch him and relieve him, Lord, of all this pain, Lord. And Lord, I pray, God, that you just touch his body, Lord, top of his head, bottom of his feet, Lord. We know, God, that, Lord, you are our healer. And Father, we pray for him. We pray you touch him. Lord, as he get ready to see the doctor, Lord, we pray that you give the doctor wisdom to, to figure out what's going on and causing this pain. And Lord, we pray for uh, Chris. And his family, Lord, um, after this accident, Father, we pray, God, that you would just touch him. And Lord, we know that uh, the, the doctors are not giving a, a, a good report, Lord, but we know, Lord, that we believe your report. And Father, we pray, God, that you would touch him and strengthen him and heal him, Lord. Whatever his injuries are, God, that you would just touch him, Lord. Touch his family and help them. Lord, we pray for Wendy, Lord, as she's uh, just having a lot of pain, Lord, we just pray, God, that you just touch her, heal her, Father, we pray. We pray for those that will be traveling, Lord, uh, not only this summer, but especially in these next couple weeks, Father, we pray, Lord, you just keep your hand upon them, give, keep them up from all harm and danger, Lord, give them good, uh, good, just good traffic and, and just keep them safe from all harm and danger, we pray. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you just anoint us tonight. To receive your word, God, that we would open up your words and learn of you, God, tonight. And Father, we praise you, we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Um, so we are in James 4. I believe everybody has a, a paper. Um, I do want to mention two more things that I, I've got. I want to mention something and ask something. Um, First thing I want to mention is two weeks from tonight, Wednesday night, we won't have service because we'll be down at camp meeting, Florida camp meeting, uh, starting on Wednesday night. So uh, two weeks from tonight, we won't have uh, Wednesday night.
because of that reason. And then my second question is, I thought about, and, and, and I told Wendy, you know, you're standing there. I thought about before last week when you brought your stand out, I said, you know, since we don't have kids ministry or anything, you know, it might be better, more convenient for us just to meet in the back room there. In the fellowship hall, we, we wouldn't have to turn everything on. And um, we could put tables out where you can put your books out and that sort of thing, at least through the summer. Um, I know the chairs might be not be cushiony, uh, but what do you all think about that idea, just uh, meeting back there? Right, just through the summer. Like, baby, we don't have to turn on the lights and the AC. Yeah, we could put your book, we could set up the tables, kind of a, just a cross, or we could do an L or whatever. Okay, so we'll, we'll start that next Wednesday. Um, thought about doing it this Wednesday and surprising everybody, but, and bring a, bring a cushion if you like, you know. I mean, we're not going to be back there that long, but um, if you want to pad your, pad your pew back there, um, do that. Um, but anyways, James Ford. We're going to read just the first uh, six verses, and then we're going to uh, talk about that. Ooh, that's right. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure? That war in your, in your members, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot co- and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That black man. By the way, welcome to uh, our uh, online, those that are watching. Got three people watching. Um, James here in James chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, accurately describes strife among Christians with the terms wars and fights. Often the battles that happen among Christians are bitter and severe. Um, Unfortunately, that's true. Um, unfortunately, I mean, that, that should be, I mean, honestly, that should be a oxymoron that, you know, Christians fighting. But, you know, it's, it's true. I mean, we've all heard of church splits and this, that, and the other. And, um, you know, just, just wars, really, in churches. Um, Paul said, or Paul said, James said, do they not come from the, the, the desires? I can't talk tonight. The desires from your desires for pleasure that war in your members. The, the source of wars and fights and arguments and all of these different things, church splits, among Christians is always the same. There is some root of carnality. There is somewhere in there the flesh is rising up. Amen? An internal war within the believer regarding the lust of the flesh. No two believers who are both walking in the Spirit towards each other can live with wars and fights among themselves. That kind of makes sense, right? Like I said, it's an oxymoron. When you have two spirit-filled Christians fighting, warring, splitting, arguing. You know, I mean, I understand that we're not all going to agree, right? Amen? We're not all going to be 100% 
uh, agree with this, that, or the other. But that doesn't mean that we should war about it. I mean, we just disagree. Not even to say that we shouldn't debate about it. Um, but we shouldn't fight about it. Whatever it is. It's not worth it. James seems to be bothered more by the selfish spirit and bitterness of the quarrels that by the rights and wrongs of various viewpoints. You, you know, you can almost say any argument, there's, there's a selfish viewpoint. Because any argument, whether it's husband and wife or brother and sister, you know, there's, there's, there's that, it's, you know, that kind of attitude. Well, it's my way, which is the right way, and your way is the wrong way, right? And so there can be some pride and there can be some flesh that rise up in that and selfishness. Um, but James here was bothered. Now, I want us to remember again that James was, was considered, if you want to say it this way, the first deacon, maybe even the first pastor of, uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, you know, after Christ, after Christ died and resurrected, and the church was born. And so here, James, and, and, and remember what we said in the beginning, James, the book of James was probably, as far as chronologically, the first letter written in the First Testament, it, it, or the New Testament. It wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as we, as we read it. I mean, if you actually did it chronologically, the first book of the New Testament would probably be James. Um, and so we see here that this is the birth of the church. The, the church was new. The, you could almost say the, the church was in the infancy stage. It was just being born. It was just starting to grow. Um, and James here is, is, is really driving the point that we shouldn't have bickering. We shouldn't have arguing. We shouldn't have fights and wars and church splits. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be in our character as, as a church of Jesus Christ. Almost all who have a, such a critical and contentious attitude claim they are prompted and supported by the Spirit of God. James makes it clear that this contentious manner comes from your own desire. It is self-evident that the Spirit of God does not create desire which issues in envy, in being envious. I mean, well, let's, let's throw an exaggeration out there. I like the blue wall. Well, God told me to paint it blue. Well, God told me to paint it red. Y'all with me? So which one did God tell you? I mean, God ain't colorblind like that, right? He knows the difference between blue and red, okay? And, you know, God doesn't change his mind and say, ah, you painted it blue, but I think I like red better, right? And so it's th these things that, that somebody might say, God led me or, or God told me or, you know, of course, we got to watch those things anyways, right? And um, understand that if you boil it all down, it's probably that person prefers blue. Well, that person prefers red, right? Um, so it wasn't a God-led uh, decision. And so you, you, you get into all of that, you know, especially with, with, uh, you know, with arguing and fighting and warring in the church body. And so James is warning the church of that. The, type of, the types of desires that lead to conflict are described here. Covet, covetousness leads to conflict. In other words, you lust, but you don't have. That's what covet, co being, you know, coveting something. You lust for it, you covet it, and you don't have it. Then he also mentions anger and animosity. 
lead to hatred and conflict or murder. That's what James said. Again, James, as we have studied the book of James, there's many references to the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And again, you can see a reference here as James looked back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was also, uh, he also used the term murder to express more than killing somebody. In other words, Jesus, uh, you know, of course the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill. But Jesus took it a, a next step further, right? If you murder somebody in your mind, right? If you, if you assassinate their character. So Jesus kind of expanded it to more than actually killing somebody, taking someone's life, actual life, literal life. And so that's what James is talking about here. The inward condition of the heart shown outwardly by anger. You are tempted to fulfill a sinful desire because you think or hope that it may be satisfied, but it will never be satisfied. Why? Why not accept why not accept your lack of satisfaction now instead of much pain and harm? You know, many, many people, and you know, we've talked about it many times, where the devil entices and he tempts. And so that person falls into that trap, whatever that trap might be, because they're, they're looking for satisfaction. And the Bible talks about that sin is pleasurable for a season, but then comes to judgment. And so we understand that there's, there's only one thing, I think we all understand, there's only one thing in eternity, honestly, that will satisfy our soul. And that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is nothing that the devil will entice or tempt us with that will give us total satisfaction. Like I said, he may entice and tempt and that person may fall into that temptation or enticement and it may satisfy temporarily, but it's not going to satisfy eternally. Amen? The, the, uh, the, all it is going to do when we fall into temptation, we fall into to sin, we fall into enticement, all it's going to do is cause a lot of pain. And, I mean, really could have been unnecessary pain and harm. Um, whatever that might be. I mean, you can name something. Whatever that might be. It could cause, you know, may satisfy for an hour, a day, a week. But it's not going to satisfy because they'll be looking for the next thing to satisfy, the next thing to satisfy. You know, talking about drugs. I mean, even drugs. You know, the, um, something like marijuana might satisfy, but then eventually the buzz wears off and you're looking for something more. Something more. And you may add pills to it. And next thing you know, you might be doing heroin or, or coke or whatever. And now none of it satisfies. So now you just continue on. As soon as you come down, you're looking for more. And that's the trap. You're never going to be satisfied. People go from relationship to relationship. Well, I'm, I'm going to be happy with this person. Well, eventually they're not satisfied. And they go from relationship to relationship to relationship. Looking and missing the, the one relationship that they should have been looking for in the first place. We can go on and on with that. But um, Then James says, Yet... Yeah. You do not have because you do not ask. The reason these destructive desires exist among Christians is because they do not seek God for their needs. You do not ask. James reminds us here of the great power of prayer and why one may live unnecessarily as a spiritual pauper simply because they do not pray. 
or they do not ask when they pray. James says you ask amiss, amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. After dealing with the problem of no prayer, now James addressed the problem of selfish prayer. These ones, when they did ask, they asked God with purely selfish motives. So James is addressing two problems here. He's addressing the, the Christians that don't pray at all. He says, you don't have because you don't ask. You don't have because you don't pray. And then the next thing he says, you don't have because you ask amiss. In other words, you're asking because you're not asking God's will. You're asking your will. You're not asking God's will be done. You're asking that your will be done. You're asking that your pleasure be satisfied. That your desire, not God's desire, but your desire. And that's what James is saying here. We must remember that the purpose of prayer is not to persuade a reluctant God to do our bidding. The purpose of prayer is to align our will with his will. And in partnership with him to ask him to accomplish his will on this earth. We know in Matthew Chapter 6, 10, when Jesus taught to pray, he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will. He didn't say, David Johnson's will be done. He says, Thy or your will be done. And so we understand that's what James is saying here. First of all, we got to pray. We, we got to pray. If we don't pray, we're not going to have. Simple enough, right? If you don't ask, you don't get. But then when you ask, are we asking our will, our desire, our pleasures? Or are we asking for God's will, God's desire, whatever his pleasure, whatever his will is? Spend is the same verb used to describe the wasteful spending of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 14. Destructive desires pers persist even if we pray because our prayers may be self-centered and self-indulgent. Do we just pray, me, 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 me? Or do we pray your will? Do we just pray for me, me and mine? It's okay, it's okay to pray for yourself and for your family. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I do. But is that all we pray? Or do we pray for those we don't know their name? Do we pray for the lost? Do we pray for the dying? Do we pray for our county? Do we pray for the harvest? Do we pray for those we, we don't know their name? Or do we just pray for our, again, our own selfish desire? James says, he calls them, pretty strong term here, adulterers and adulteresses. This is a rebuke presented in Old Testament vocabulary. We can go back to the Old Testament, especially a lot of, well, really, the major and the minor prophets that that called the, the, the nation of Israel an adulteress. Anybody heard that before no, or read that in the Old Testament? Because they, they turned from God and they turned to other gods and they, they turned to idolatry and they, tur they turned to all of these other things except for the one that they're supposed to be, their affection is supposed to be set on. So James here is warning, now again, this is the early church. And he's calling them, just like they did in the Old Testament, adulterers and adulteresses. Pretty strong language. God spoke this way in the Old Testament when his people were attracted to some form of idolatry. As James saw here, their covetousness was idolatry and friendship with the world. 
according to this picture, God is the husband and we are his wife. The Jews, because of their covenant with God, are represented as being a spouse or married to him. And hence their idolatry. In other words, they cheated. I mean, if you want to put a, kind of get a picture, they cheated on God. They cheated on God with whatever God probably did, probably uh, fulfilled their desire, right? And James is warning the early church, and and as as we are here tonight, he's warning the current church not to fall into that trap. Their iniquity or their sin in general are represented under the notion of adultery. Do you know that friendship with the world is enmity or or an enemy against God? James recognizes that we cannot both be friends of the world system in rebellion against God and friends of God at the same time. Matthew 6, 24 talks about you can't serve two masters. You can't you can't hold on to one or the other. Well, actually, you can hold on to one or the other. You can't hold on to both. Even the desire to be a friend or wants to be a friend of the world makes that one an enemy of God. Now, now is that saying... Is James saying we got to stay in our own Christian bubble and we can't have friends that aren't Christians? No, he's not saying that. He's not saying we, I mean, honestly, we should have non-Christian friends. We, we might be the only light they, they see. We might be the only Bible they read. Honestly. But it's the worldly system. It's the world. It's not, we're not talking about individuals, but we're talking about the world, the enemy, the, the ways of the world. We can't follow the ways of the world and follow the ways of God. Right? Um, such friendship with the world means that one is on a footing of hostility towards God. I don't know about you, but I sure don't want to be an enemy of God. I I don't want, you know, because God is opposite of the world. And and God don't, you know, he don't, sin is not in his presence. You know what I mean? It's not that God is enemy. I, I don't want to be misunderstood. God is not the enemy of those that aren't saved. He loves them. But it's the ways of the world, the the world system. Um, For it defies his will and despises his purpose. Disguise it as one may, it is an implicit challenge to God. The strong statements, these are pretty strong statements that James is saying. I mean, he's talking, you're an adulterer, you're an adulteress. And you're an enemy to God. That's pretty strong, right? If you hold on to the world. They remind us that all was not beautiful in the early church. Not everybody was perfect, right? Probably a good good lesson for us. They had plenty of carnality and worldliness to deal with. While the New Testament church is a clear pattern for us, we should not over-romanticize it and and, uh, the spiritual character of early Christians. You know, we got to remember, they didn't have the Bible like we have the Bible. I mean, they're learning from maybe preachers on the corner, preachers in the, you know, I mean, they weren't allowed in their synagogues, right? So, I mean, if you read the book of Acts, they went house to house, they had church. House to house to house. And so, all the, kind of like we talked about Saul slash Paul last week, all, everything they learned from a child up was now being 
changed. All the, all the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? All the, the uh, routines that they, that's not the, part, the word I was looking for, but the routines that they learn are now different. Now they didn't have to go to sacrifice an animal's blood to atone for their sins. Now they could just go themselves. That had to be different, right? The strong statements that James reminds us that they weren't perfect. The spirit who dwells in us, James says, yearns jealously. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit has a jealous yearning for our friendship with God. The Spirit will convict the Christian who lives in compromise. Now, I don't know about you, but through my Christian life, the Holy Spirit has convicted me of things. Things that, that, uh, that I, you know, maybe words I've said or things I've done. And, and I'll give you an example, and I don't mean to... Uh, I hope this word don't offend anybody, but when I was a youth pastor, I used to say crap all the time. And I, I hope that don't offend nobody, but I used to say it, you know. And it, the Holy Spirit just convicted me of that saying that word, and I had to kind of train myself to, to use another word instead of that word. Um, you know, I didn't think it was a you know, cuss word, but it was just kind of that in-between uh, thing and, I don't think you're going to go to hell for saying it or something, but he just convicted me. You say it, that's fine. I'm just, it's me. I'm not putting that on you. And uh, so I had to change that, and so I did. And uh, I'm not saying I don't ever say it, but, you know, I, 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 it's just one of those things. And so I changed it. And, um, of course, I ain't perfect at it, but I'm better. And uh, so that's, that's what the Holy Spirit does. If, if there's something in our life that he don't like, that God don't like, he's going to convict us. He's not going to condemn us. We've talked about that before. He's not going to condemn us, but he is going to convict us to do better. It is, it, is it God jealously yearning for the devotion of our spirit which he put within us? Or is it the spirit within us jealously yearning for the full devotion of our heart. Either way, the sense is much the same. So, I kind of like this part. It said, is God, Spirit, yearning more for us? Or is the Holy Spirit that is in us, living in us, yearning for God? But honestly, it's, it's both. Because God is yearning for us and hopefully our spirits are yearning for God to be together. He went so far as to speak of them as adulterers and adulteresses. And then adopting a gentler pleading tone, he says, you are grieving the Holy Spirit who has come to dwell within you who yearns with a jealous envy to possess your entire nature for himself. So James calls them an ad adulterers and adulteresses, and now he's saying, hey, the Holy Spirit that is in you is yearning for, for God. Come back to God. Stop cheating on God and Bring him back into your center focus. It's kind of the bottom line. James agrees with many passages in the Old Testament that tells us God is a jealous God. The idea is that God loves men with such a passion that he cannot bear any other love within the hearts of men. You know, it's kind of like, I know some of y'all weren't here because of the wedding, but Monroe sung that song and talked about uh, you know, when 
does he still feel the nails? Remember that song? And, uh, you know, whenever we fail, whenever we mess up, you know, the, is it like he feels the nails again because his heart is breaking um, because of, um, that's how much he loves us. You know, it's, it's like when, as a parent, when your children, you know, disobey you and maybe do something that you knew would, would cause trouble. And they got, they got in this trouble or whatever, and you knew they would, and you warned them and warned them and taught them, and, all, and they still did it. And it breaks your heart to see them suffer and maybe see the consequence of that. But, the, I mean, you did everything you know to do, can do. You can't, you can't make the decisions for them. And so I feel like, you know, sometimes, or probably all the time, God is the same with us. He tries to warn us. He gives us his word. He speaks to us through prayer. He, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And there are so many times we still mess up. We still do what we know better, but we still do it. And we get into trouble, and there's consequence, and it, it breaks his heart. I believe it does. Because he loves us that much. Think of the inner pain and torture inside the person who is betrayed by an unfaithful spouse who must reckon with the truth. I am faithful to them, but they are not faithful to me. This is what the Spirit of God feels regarding our world-loving hearts. You can imagine a cheating spouse and what that, that scenario would, would cause. One cannot find the exact quote that we read in James where it says, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. That's actually not a verse in the Bible except for in James. But James seems to present an idea that is alluded to several passages without quoting any specific passage. So it's kind of like paraphrasing. More probably is the view that James was not citing a particular passage, but summarizing or paraphrasing the truth expressed in several Old Testament. James says, but he gives more grace. The same Holy Spirit convicting us of our compromise will also grant us the grace to serve God as we should. This wonderful statement, but he gives more grace grace stands in strong contrast to the previous words Charles Spurgeon said this he says do you suffer from spiritual poverty it is your own fault for he giveth more grace if you have not got it it is because it is not because it is not to be had but because you have not gone for it. You know, God gives us the grace. I mean, He's full of grace. The only reason we're saved is because of His grace. And the only reason we, well, I'll talk for myself, the only reason I've had a million chances in my life is because of His grace. You know, every time I mess up, it's because of His grace. Now, don't get me wrong, we shouldn't take that grace for, for granted, we shouldn't do what we know not to do and say, well, you know, he'll forgive me because of his grace. We shouldn't do that. But it's because of his grace that we're saved. It's because of his grace that we can make it every day. It's because of his grace um, that he blesses us and helps us and strengthens us. And it's because of his grace when we do mess up. His love draws us, but it's, it's His grace that, that kind of embraces us and, and forgives us. The James finishing these first few verses says, God resists the proud. Anybody ever heard that verse? At the same time, James reminds us that this grace only comes to the humble. Grace and pride are eternal enemies. Opposite. Pride demands that God bless me in light of my merits. 
whether real or imagined. But grace will not deal with me on the basis of anything in me, good or bad, but only on the basis of who God is. You know, pride will keep us away from God, but grace will bring us to God. Pride will say, well, it's because I go to church. It's because I... Let, let, me, let me back up the, the, the story that Jesus gives of, of two, men, two men in the temple. And one man who was like a, a Pharisee, he, he, he's there, and then there's another man that's very humble that he couldn't even lift up his eyes. And he, he just cried, and, 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 and I'm paraphrasing, he cried and, and begged and, you know, just, God, thank you, thank you. I can't, you know, I can't believe that you have forgiven me. I, I can't believe, uh, oh, God, I, I, I love you. I thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. And then the, the Pharisees over there, straight up, looking up, and he says, thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Thank me that I'm not like that guy over there. Y'all know the story? That sounds like pride. Well, the other one sounds like humble, humility. And I would guess that God rejected the one that was full of pride. And he accepted the one that was full of humility. And so God resists the pride. But he gives grace to the humble. You know, I, uh, it's uh, Ephesians, I think, Ephesians chapter 2, that says we can't be saved by our works. We're only saved by grace. Only by His grace are we saved. It doesn't matter how much money we've given. It doesn't matter how many hours we've given. It doesn't matter how many times we've been to church. It doesn't matter if we've been baptized a hundred times. None of that matters. It's not, it's not works. It's by His grace. It's a free gift. And somebody with pride could say, well, hey, I gave all of this in the offering, and I, I gave uh, you know, thousands of hours to feed the homeless, or whatever it might be, and I've done this, and I've been to church every time the doors open, and all this kind of stuff. And, 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 and pride could well up, and pride could, um, could uh, you know, use in pride. But God resists the proud, and he saves those that are humble. We'll talk more about that, but I don't think we've got time tonight. But Let's finish this up. But God gives grace to the humble. It isn't as if our humility earns the grace of God. Humility merely puts us in a position to receive the gift that God gives us. Humble, you know, you know uh, people could be proud, people could have pride in their humbleness. I've heard, I've heard people, I've heard preachers say, well, I'm the most humble person you'll ever meet. That just didn't sound right to me. Yeah? Yeah. I'm, I'm the most humble person you'll ever meet. Hmm, okay. That sounds, that sounds proud, prideful. And maybe they were, I don't know, but just sounded prideful to me. And uh, it's not because of our humility, it's not because of our humbleness that God accepts us. It's because we, because of our humbleness, we position ourselves. It's like that story, the man was standing with his eyes raised, the man was kneeling with his, he couldn't even look, he, he, his eyes were down. And it's that stature, uh, stature. you're in the right stature, you're in the right position to receive that whatever God has because of His grace. Amen? I know we're, I don't want to rush through the next few verses because they're all very good verses, so we'll, we'll save that for next week. Uh, verse 7 on. Um, but any thoughts, questions, comments? All good? All right.
Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for, Lord, your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for every person here, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you continue to bless us and help us, Lord, as a church, Lord, as a family, as an individual, God. Lord God, that you just move in our hearts and our lives. Help us to have opportunities, Lord, to, to share Jesus with others, Father. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for all that we've learned. Lord, I pray, God, that, that Lord, we just, our, our heart's desire is to be more like you. Father, help us, Lord. Mold us, God, to be what you would have us to be. Father, we praise you. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, those that are out there. We love you and appreciate you.